Jonathan Strange is like a precious cinnamon bun and needs to be protected. We need to talk about how I'm now basically Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell trash. Now, I don't know if I mentioned it, but I did read the book back in June, actually of this year, so only a couple months ago. It is a tome, by the way. It is a long ass effing book and it is a slog. It's not fast. It's written in a pastiche style, so it kind of reads like Dickens and or Austen, except more like Dickens, less like Austen. It is an alternate history fantastical novel that takes place during the Napoleonic Wars in England, and magic is dead in England. It apparently existed probably about 300 years prior, but ever since then, the only magicians are theoretical magicians. They research it, they write about it, but nobody can actually practice magic. That is until a guy named Mr. Norrell proves that he is a working practical magician, and right about the same time, another gentleman named Jonathan Strange also kind of rises as a magician, and the two come together to be kind of friends, partners, and you see their relationship actually eventually totally dissolve, and many shenanigans ensue, and it's very hard to sum up this book in like under an hour. It is a wildly popular and well-known book, apparently. I know that I had heard of it before, I had never read it. I became far more aware of it when I heard a TV series was being made of it, and I was like, why do I know this title? And of course you look up the cover, and you realize you've probably seen this cover floating around. It's a fairly iconic, rather striking cover. I rated it four out of five stars in that I really enjoyed it, but I did actually find the pastiche style a little distracting at times. It made it oftentimes harder for me to connect with the characters because I felt very distant from them, just so apart from them because th this pastiche style was just like a barbed wire fence that was in my way at times. It didn't always bother me, but frequently it would. And given the arcs that these characters go on, especially Jonathan Strange, my baby, that's a problem. Of course, I will freely admit, could have been an issue of having been listening versus me physically reading. So there are some very intense emotions that are going on here. I mean, it's not even just dealing with magic, but other things that occur. There's deaths, there's heartbreak, there's loss. I mean, there's, there's war, there's so much that happens. And anytime I feel unable to connect with the emotions or that something is deliberately kind of barring me from getting as emotionally invested as I could be. I do find that problematic and again I just found the pastiche style did that sometimes. I was more distracted by the pastiche style than really able to immerse myself into it. So we then come to the TV show. A friend of mine said oh you know it's on Netflix and I was like hold the phone it's on Netflix I'm gonna watch it because I knew Eddie Marson was in it and I like Eddie Marson and so I start watching it and um I gotta say it, I enjoyed the show more than I enjoyed the book. Now again, I rated the book four out of five stars and I really liked the book. I do actually think it is a bit of a masterpiece, but I like the TV show more. I got more enjoyment and I was more emotionally invested in the television series than I was in the novel. And keep in mind, despite the fact I read the novel back in June, or rather listened to the novel back in June, I didn't remember a lot of it. There's a lot that slipped through the cracks and I'm sure if I were to then pick up the novel and like actually physically read the novel, I would do better. But I remembered some kind of basically major plot points. I mean, like if we're talking like road posts, like things I really need to know about each character. Yeah, I remembered those, but there was a lot of other stuff that I just sort of like, goodbye, I don't remember you anymore. So watching this show, there was an element of me kind of vaguely remembering things, but then also going, I d oh, I'm definitely still surprised. I'm still on the edge of my seat. I still want to know. The fact that this show was able to condense and streamline and tell a 1000 plus page story in the span of basically, what, seven hours? It's just pretty dang incredible. It really is. And to do it in such a way where it still felt like the book. We are in the Napoleonic Wars. I mean, the Battle of Waterloo opens one of the episodes. It's pretty fantastic and it's, it's emotionally devastating, but it's still awesome. And you still get the sense of that world because you visually see it. And the visuals are one of the many high points of this show in that I think they do a better job of immersing you into the story and into the magic than the book did in my, again, in my opinion. This was just me where 
again, I couldn't always immerse myself in the book. Sometimes I could, but oftentimes I couldn't. I would get very distracted by the writing style. Because there's no writing style in the TV series, I'm not distracted by it. Instead, I'm flung headfirst into, well, initially Yorkshire, we go to London, we go to Portugal, we're on the ocean, we're all over the place. We're in Lost Hope, which is a fae kingdom. This is one of the few times I loved fairy. It's not that I don't like fairies. I just don't care about them. I don't get like super excited over the idea of fairies. But fairy, this is the kind of fairy I want to see. It is dark and gloomy and dangerous as all get out. And dude, the gentleman with the thistle down hair. Of course I had the moment of going, aren't you Albert Blythe from Band of Brothers? Yeah, I know you. This is a fun game I play with almost every British series I ever watch. I go, I know you from something. But I think again, seeing the magic and being in the world and experiencing it visually is a better way to experience the story. Because you go, ah, yes, this is visual cue, I understand. And I also think it does a remarkable job of things that in a novel, you have to essentially tell the reader, especially in that 18th century novel style, which you can show in a visual medium and so you don't have to spend as much time on it instead it is a visual cue and you understand for me one of the best moments that exhibits this involves the contrast between jonathan strange and mr norrell this is my obligatory spoiler warning to you skip to whatever time code i tell you here so the thing for me that i found best illustrated one of the key differences between norrell and strange besides the obvious way in which they do magic involves the moments in which they actually complete resurrection. In episode one, Mr. Norrell performs a resurrection, but he does it by summoning a fairy and making a deal. Obviously, I mean, if he he has learned nothing, it is, it is the most ultimate, like Faustian deals of Faustian deals and the fairy cheats him. And of course, like, of course, we're sitting here going, don't do, ho, don't do it. Ho, don't, you did the thing. You did the thing and now shit gonna go down. Like, you know, it's not gonna end well. Anywho, Norrell spends the rest of the series trying to hide the fact that he did this. I mean, it is equal parts he knows it was a bad idea. He knew it was a bad idea going into it, and he also wants to make it seem like he's this great magician that he's like, I had to enlist help. No, I can't tell other people I enlisted help in order to perform this great feat. Like, I can't do that. <laughs> no, 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 I did this all on my lonesome and I'm gonna tell nobody how I did it. And in trying to constantly cover up what he did to resurrect this young woman who's uh, Lady Pole, it causes a lot of problems. It causes way more harm than good. And he never really takes responsibility for what he did. He doesn't own what he did. Instead, he spends his entire time trying to basically pretend it never happened and that like it's done and please people stop talking about it. However, Jonathan Strange performs his own version of resurrection and I do believe it is episode three. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong. It's two or three. They kind of blend together in my head, but I'm fairly certain it's three. Jonathan Strange has been sent basically by his majesty's government to go and aid in the Napoleonic war going on in Portugal. And while he's there, they find out that, hey, some Neapolitans have this cannon, we're trying to get it. Unfortunately, the only Neapolitans we have are dead ones. And Jonathan Strange, by this point, he has watched his servant die right in front of his eyes. I mean, literally, I mean, give his own life, like fling him out of the way that cannon shot die. All of his books of magic have been destroyed. He's literally at the limits of everything that could be called modern gentlemanly magic. And he's like, look, the only other magic I know is the magic being done by, that was done by the Raven King. And I know Mr. Norrell was totally against that. He's like, but I am at my wits and war, the whole war is hell. And you can see there's this like fraying, this breaking point where, where Strange is like, I'm gonna do the thing. I have to do the thing, I'm gonna do the thing. So he performs this very ancient and uh, magic and they have these corpses of these three Neapolitan soldiers and he sort of brings them back kind of, they're really more like zombies than anything else. It's not true resurrection, kind of the way it was with Lady Pole and Mr. And Mr. Norrell summoning the fairy. And Strange is horrified at what he's done. I, you, He hates it the moment it happens. And what happens is he summons them and they're in like a mill. And of course, hey, they find out where the cannon is. Everybody leaves, but Jonathan Strange stays. He spends three days locked in this mill trying to figure out how to make these men dead again. He owns the fact that he did this thing and he takes responsibility for the fact that he did it. And he says, I have, I did the thing. I have to undo it. This is 
my work, therefore I need to do it. Like this is a thing I must do. And for me, that was the fundamental difference between Norrell and Strange in terms of their character. Okay, we're gonna call this end of spoilers. Moving on. The obvious difference between Strange and Norrell was always that I think of, I think of Mozart and Salieri and Amadeus, sort of. I'm gonna amend it a little. Mozart was sort of the innate genius. It he didn't always know where it was coming from, like whatever music he was creating, it just, that's just what he did. And that's very much what Jonathan Strange is. He doesn't know what he's doing half the time and he freely admits it. He's like, I don't know how I did this, but I did the thing. It's just, I know what thing I need to do, and so I do it. Whereas Norrell is very much like Celieri. He studied and studied and studied and knows all of the techniques because he studied so hard. Now also Norrell kind of hoarded all of the books on magic and didn't let anybody else see them. And that is the one thing I really got to get on Mr. Norrell about that you do have to learn to share. You cannot hoard it all to yourself. I, I always had an innate problem with that, with, with Mr. Norrell. I love his devotion to books, but dude, you can't just deny everyone that. But again, this is this is just me. There, Norrell's a bit of an elitist at times, and, and bless him, love him, and hate him at times. He is. And that's one of the big differences between the two, and that's made very, very clear throughout the show. Um, it was obviously made very clear throughout the book. I loved how the actors played that. And it's amazing to me how Eddie Marson plays Mr. Norrell, how you can go from kind of liking Mr. Norrell for the first couple of episodes and you very quickly start to dislike him. They definitely turn an about face where you're like, oh, like you really don't agree with what Norrell does. He goes through uh, Strange and his wife's letters while Strange is away at war. Like he intercepts their letters, doesn't let either of them get them, which I'm sorry, that's uncool. He obviously constantly lies about the whole fairy thing, hoards all the books of magic, denies other people to call themselves magicians because God forbid there'd be more than one magician in England at the same time. I have strong feelings that are a little anti norrell I love him, but I have a lot of problems with the things that he does. This is not to say that Jonathan Strange is perfect, but he is kind of my cinnamon bun and I want to protect him. The actor who portrayed him was so good. He literally, it was like, tore my heart out, lit it on fire, and then stomped on the ashes for the entire time, because there's a major plot point right around midway through the season. Yeah, midway through, I want to say episode five or six, which kind of spins Jonathan Strange off into like crazy town. And it's so hard to watch because you've grown to love this character over the course of like, you know, five to six episodes, and you know there's only a couple left, and I just went going, hey, <laughs> he <laughs> Jay Strange, Jonathan Strange, my, my poor, my, Strange. Maybe this is because me, as a creative, I can identify with something that's made very clear in that magic and madness are in a way very similar. There is a kind of madness to it, and that it's very easy to go a little off your rails, and I, I, there was something about Strange and the fact that he was almost entirely pathos so much of the time. So, I mean, if he's pathos, Norrell is Logos and, oh yeah, it's pretty much like that the whole way. We got a whole new, like, Julius Caesar thing going on here. And I identify with the pathos a lot. I'm very analytical, but I highly identify with the pathos of Strange's character. And I was so down for basically everything he was all about, and I was just like... I can't, I can't handle. Basically, long story short, I am absolute trash for this show because it was so good, I binged it in one sitting. And now I'm watching it again because it was just so good. And I gotta say, and, and it is due in part because this, the source material is so rich and there is so much there. It gets very frank about some stuff. I mean, you're dealing with elitism, slavery, you know, a little bit of se sexism, uh, mental illness slash madness, taking responsibility for one's actions, and really just kind of responsibility in general, especially when it comes to power. <laughs> and it's so fascinating to see how this show managed it. And yet, it was always about the characters. It was always about the characters and their journey. And the actor who played Jonathan Strange, whose name is Bertie Carvel? 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 I think it's Carvel. It was so wonderful in playing that role, but he made a good point where he talks about Strange, he says, He comes of age, as we all do in life, many times. He doesn't sort of grow up and then he's grown up. He grows up from this sort of 
fairly hapless gentleman uh, wastrel um, it, and he goes through certain things comes a man's father dies goes to war uh, but each time you, you sort of think he's arrived the, the horizon recedes and so you kind of start off in Henry the fourth part one and you end up in King Lear literally life is about constantly growing up and that you're yeah you'll reach a summit but hey there's an even higher summit in the distance and you got to go reach that and it's this constant ladder and i thought that was a great way to describe this series and the journey especially that strange goes on because norrell has to learn to take responsibility for what he did but i norrell of all the characters he does change but not in so for me, constant and steady a way that Strange does, which again is probably why I gravitate towards Strange as a protagonist more than I do Mr. Norrell. And that Norrell stays pretty much the same through a lot of it, and it's not until kind of near the end that I think he just, just genuinely starts to realize that like, this is what you, like, this is all because of you. This is kind of all your fault. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, it's like, <laughs> You opened a door and you didn't close it, and now, like, half of hell has now walked in. Speaking metaphorically, that doesn't actually happen in the show, obviously. If you're looking for something that is equal parts costume drama, equal parts kind of supernatural, really good fantasy magic, this is something you want to check out. It is available on Netflix. It's seven hours of your time. It would be- that would be very well spent. And you can join me on the We Must Protect Jonathan Strange at All Costs train. Him and his wife. His He and his wife are like the, the best dynamic. Oh my god. I was so invested with them kind of from the get-go. But I'm on the Protect Jonathan Strange at all costs train, and this show broke my heart into a million pieces. It's fine. It's fine. You should all go watch it. That's it for me today, you guys. So until next time, cheers.